Hello. Hello, and thank you for joining us um, at IMF 2020, the late session, day three. My name is Lauren Chang. I'm your moderator. Our Q&A facilitator is Laura McClure. Our social media facilitator is Lisa Imamora, and our content coordinator is Elizabeth Soriano. Please note your microphones will be muted and cameras turned off during the presentation. We are recording all the presentations to post to the IMF YouTube channel, so we want the audio quality to be as clear as possible. We're also live streaming on the IMF's YouTube channel. This afternoon session um, is a little different than what we have done so far. The session's presentations were originally conceived as part of a panel discussion addressing challenges and evolution in fabricating mannequins for real people at various institutions and exhibitions around the world. We ended up with so much good content to share with you that in the interest of time, we decided to present all the talks together and save the Q&A for the end of the session. Please feel free to send questions through the Q&A on Zoom. Um, also, Lisa will be watching social media and Slack for additional questions. If you have a question for a specific person, please use their name so that we know it's directed to them. We will do our best to get to your questions. Whatever we can't answer now, please bring to the after party tonight, the IMF Slack app, hashtag day three late session, or contact our presenters directly. If you wanna know more about each presenter, their bios are on the website at www.mountmakersforum.net. We have affectionately been calling this session, Now You See Me, Now You Don't. The nine talks will be broken into three sections. The first three talks will be focused around decisions and involution within specific institutional settings. The second group will offer talks detailing solutions to mannequins where heads and or extremities need to be visible. The third section consists of four talks around situations where the human part of the mannequin support was not to be seen, or in the case of one talk, a key component for context was not available. Okay, let's get started. We begin with a conversation between curator Emil Hermini Horses and Mount Maker Shelley Euler from the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC, USA. Following their talk, exhibition designer, preparator, Jim Williams, and assistant professor and curator, Sarah Hume, will discuss Mannequin Manners, Kent State University Museum in Kent, Ohio, USA. And finally, textile conservator, Sarah Owens, will talk about the change of approach to display of clothing at the Anchorage Museum in Anchorage, Alaska, USA. All right, so Emma, I thought we would just jump right to the first show that you and I worked on together, which was in 2004, and was one of the exhibits that opened our museum at the mall in uh, DC, and it's called Our Universe's Traditional Knowledge Shapes Our World. We've got a few pictures here of some of the mannequins in the exhibit, and I thought maybe you could tell us why we have such different looking mannequins in this particular show. We have, you know, life cast mannequins and uh, garments that are supported in a more abstract way. Uh, our universes talks about our cosmology, uh, our worldview. And in this exhibition, we included eight native communities from throughout the whole Western hemisphere. So we went from Alaska to Canada, the United States, Central America, and then South America, working with native communities. And it was really in working with these, what we call the co-curators. And it was their wish, and, but we did not want to have like really super realistic faces on these. Um, there was one thing that they spoke of one time seeing some of the old dioramas that they used to do like a natural history. Uh, they did not want to see something like that that was really kind of antiquated. And so they wanted something 
visually appealing, but also not to take away from the garments, from, from the traditional items. And so that's why you see these mannequins the way they are. And so this is the way that they, they expressed and how they should be displayed. And we ran, we, in, in consultation with them, we actually ran all of these things by them for their approval when we were conducting, I mean, doing this exhibition. I thought maybe that we could talk a little bit more about specific mannequins that, uh, that we worked on. So for the Lakota section, this one that I chose is a very simple mannequin, right? But I chose it for a specific reason, which is that sometimes we have to make compromises. Um, <laughs> right? And well, maybe you can speak more to why we chose this particular pose for this dress. And for women to um, be able to um, to decorate a dress like this or to sit down and be like this was really an accomplishment for her. So where the men um, may have proved themselves through war deeds, uh, the women proved themselves through artistic abilities. And so this dress, which is uh, like a, what we call a heavily beaded uh, yoke dress, um, we really wanted to display all the you know details on this on this dress and 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 how much it took to to really actually bead uh, well one to get all the materials for this is is a challenge and then to sit down and and to bead something that this uh, completely and um, with a design element so we really want to kind of display that you don't see a lot of uh, accessories on this dress. You don't see the belt, you don't see some of the other things that would have accompanied this one. But we just really wanted to illustrate this form, which is really became a, a very typical style today of a women's traditional outfit. Mm -hmm. But And one of the things that was kind of uh, an interesting challenge for this dress, because there's all the fringe and they do it, it just kind of bell out a little bit, there's a lot of volume at the bottom mm -hmm. of the dress. And so we found that if we let it hang naturally, that it would definitely have been bumping into that piece of case furniture, which would have been not good for the dress. And so we ended up discussing and making the, the mannequin. So it almost looks like like a superwoman, mm -hmm. you know, when hopefully you don't see it that way as it's displayed and it's really just kind of spreading the dress out. Correct. Right. Um, but I think what I like about this, the way we, we set it up is you don't see a lot of folds or wrinkles mm -hmm. in it, just the way it's, it's shown now, more visually appealing, even though it seems like the skirt is, you know, very wide. Again, mm -hmm. um, so a few years later, we worked together on a, on a really large show that was very, it was all about the garments. You know, one of the things about this, um, this exhibition, it was really the evolution of dress styles from the early, early, what we call the two high dresses uh, made of two hides and how it, once trade was introduced and they developed more in beads, cloth, and you'll see the influence of, of how all these trade materials Kind of change the style a bit, but still there's some there's still some links through it all that you see that the the communities yeah so these um, are contemporary dresses that we acquired for the exhibition and they represent southern plains and the dress with the heavily beaded blue uh, is from the northern plains and you can see the now with these southern dresses we had more of the accessories associated with them they have these beaded crowns which kind of comes from the idea of these women were often elected to be princesses representing their tribal nations representing veteran groups and so here we had to come up to our you had to come up with some <laughs> some way of floating this crown and all the accessories uh, to make it look realistic I remember that we had a lot of conversations about that because we essentially had two choices, right? Is either we were going to have a head or we were going to have the idea of the head. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I and, wanted to talk um, specifically about the Jane Myers dress. As a mannequin maker, it was, you know, this kind of thing is a little bit intimidating um, <laughs> when the, the artist and the, the person who danced the dress would be visiting the exhibit. <laughs> and, um, so on one hand, that's a, you know, that adds to the challenge and you really, and you know, you always want to do it right, but it's like, you really want to do it right. Um, but then also it gave a kind of a wonderful opportunity too, because you supplied me with these pictures and, and then there were videos I could look at to see 
where everything was supposed to hang in just mm -hmm. the right places for the beadwork. Because often, you know, you might have the measurements of somebody, but it still just might not look right, right until it's like, oh, that needs to go there and that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know we were very fortunate to be able to have images of, of these ladies wearing um, various regalia um, and, and how they, they hung. Uh, the leggings you see there, the blue leggings and moccasins, uh, that's part of the uh, Joyce Growing Thunder uh, dress that you just saw, the blue dress. Uh, you know, we did consult with them too and how they should, you know, should sit, the leggings, the moccasins, things like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought up these slides because uh, when you were just talking about the uh, you know, getting the feet just right and getting everything mm -hmm. placed right, th those kinds of needs forced us to think about new ways of approaching the mannequins too. So we came up with the this idea of the gartered leg that's attached to the torso, but it's a little bit flexible and the feet are weighted as much as it's safe to weight them so that we can move them into a position on site and have some flexibility there, depending on how the light's hitting it, depending on how uh, what just looks right for the situation. So mm -hmm. that, that's that been a nice addition to our, our mannequin toolbox. And then the hair ties were a particular, that was a kind of a fun challenge too, because we had decided not to have hair, but there mm -hmm. were hair ties. <laughs> <laughs> so we eventually came up with this idea that I think you can see a little bit of it here from the back we used a kind of a, a foam backer rod and wrapped that in fleece. And then Emil took the shoelaces and uh, did the tying on. And then that whole ensemble just kind of goes around the neck. And then you can see that it just comes around the front of her shoulders there. And then the hair ties hang as though they were. You, you can see it with Jane um, in her uh, photo there, where you uh, see the red, the red uh, ties that are wrapped around her braids. And that was kind of the illusion we were going for with the, with the mannequin was to make it look like these braids were coming out. And, uh, yeah. So at least it wouldn't be distracting too. That was right. part of the balance that we, you know, if we couldn't go for full reality, then at least let it not be like, well, why is that even there? You know? So mm -hmm. um, that's also part of that compromise. So last but not least this is a show called circle of dance um which the entire show was curated by our colleague cecile gantome but you and i worked together a lot on uh this mannequin so this is a northern traditional uh beaded outfit by a, a man named um uh, robert tiger um uh, boy tiger he beaded this outfit the challenge was putting it into a very small space <laughs> and, and trying to get movement out of it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the entire reason for this exhibit to be was dance, right? It was to mm -hmm. represent in each of those cases, a specific dance in a specific pose from a specific place. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the cases were existing cases and we were fitting into those cases. Um, but we did want realism in the pose so that even if there was an actual movement happening, that people could connect the pose that was chosen to the video that they're seeing and go, and recognize, oh, that's that one. You know, I see. You know, I see mm. that one. And so there was a lot of conversations in all the from all the different tribes and groups that um, on what's the what's the pose that's representative of this dance, and it's not an easy thing to do. So for me thankfully for this case you had you gave me a double bonus which was a picture of robert tiger in the actual regalia and a picture of someone uh, who's the gentleman who's dancing um his name's terry fiddler terry fiddler and he's, he, he's from south dakota and he's a, a champion northern traditional dancer and you can see by the pose he's he's the model you know for this mm -hmm. pose you can't get better than that for having <laughs> having mm -hmm. something to work with and you can see i just wanted to show in the the mannequin before it's dressed that um i mean we do build all our mannequins from the ground up essentially you know we, we work with foam and and metal and and uh various things to to create the the forms um but for these, he was very, his, his ensemble was super heavy. That, that vest alone is what like, feels like 20 pounds. Um, the bell, yeah, it's, it's heavily beaded. I mean, very, he, he made it himself. Mm -hmm. um, and so we just really wanted to highlight that. And I think he did a good job. 
Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, but because of the weight of it, it's like, you know, the arms had to be reinforced in a slightly different way than we usually do. The, you can see that the, that the back structure, the shoulders are kind of, they're more of a shelf. They have to be more of a shelf to carry all that weight. And then you see the, the torso that's cut in several pieces to allow us to twist um, the body it, it, to add a little bit more uh, animation as we you know, needed to. And, and the other thing that was both a challenge and a fun problem to solve for this one was that there would be hands and feet sometimes and faces visible. And we wanted in a similar way to how um, it was approached in our universes, we didn't want full on portraiture, but we wanted each dancer in each of the cases to look like a little bit like they would. So I used a variety of materials to sort of make uh, the dancer to take on some of the features of Robert Tiger, just very generally like the brow line and a little bit of the, the cheekbones and a little bit of the nose and just to have a kind of a look. And then our designers uh, decided up for color wise on, on this medium gray that would fade into the background of the case, but would still read as identifiable, you know, body parts, but it's clearly not the color that the skin would be. And then we worked with Foss shape to make hands and, and faces that could, as you can see, the, for example, with the fan here, there's a mount that holds, and this is in process, so it's not quite a finished mount, but there's a mount that holds the fan in place and it has a variety of set screws and things that allow us to twist it and turn it how we need it to go. And then uh, we could put the, the hand over that and cut the foss shape so that it's not actually rubbing against the object and then put everything into place and it would give the look of the hand holding it. Then that also leads into our other compromise that normally in these ensembles, he'd be wearing a, a bustle, right? Yeah, he'd be wearing a, a feathered bustle. And, but um, to have him featured not wearing something uh, would just kind of look out of place. So the compromise was these two um, uh, spikes um, with these plumes on the end um, would have been part of, part of the dance bustle. And then there would have been like a whole feathered uh, thing that would come around, come around the back. Um, so we didn't feature that part, but it looks, you know, you, you see the illusion that there is a bustle back there just by seeing those plumes that are sticking up from the back. Mm -hmm. And so it brings us circle back around to fitting in the case again. <laughs> yeah, right. Because <laughs> if he were actually leaning over like he is, the way these cases are, the glass kind of slopes back. And so it gets a little shallower the higher you go in the case. And so, so we needed to make some compromises there. But it does look like, if you look at it from the front here, it does look like like his, his bustle. You know? So, you know, we hope that uh, for these examples, um, We've introduced you to some of the challenges and the decisions that we've we've looked at over the years and continue to look at. It's a ever evolving, continuing conversation that we have with some of the, the same challenges coming up over and over again, but each one pushing us to to try to do it a little bit better each time and hopefully hopefully we have and we'll continue this conversation in the future. Thank you, Emil, so much. Okay, for being well, here. thank you. Thank you for taking me back this far <laughs> <laughs> down, down, down memory lane here. <laughs>
Uh, these were made by Pucci in the late 1990s, early 2000s. I think it was the early 90s, actually. Early 90s, okay. And then the Toledos were designed by Isabel and Ruben Toledo, uh, specifically for an exhibition that we had here at the museum. And the contemporaries we just recently bought for an exhibition that we're gonna talk about uh, for coming up really quickly. Um, as you can see though, all of them are bright white, uh, which is uh, an improvement over what they were when I got here, which was a lovely shade of tantalizing tan. Uh, which was supposedly a skin tone, which, as you can imagine, can be problematic. So we decided to make it a more generic uh, tone and get away from any kind of a depiction of a specific skin color. Um, and that's where we are for the most part right now. Um, Sarah, though, in Fashions of South Africa, we decided to go a slightly different direction. So anyway, talk a little bit about the process, because here we were doing a show specifically of uh, objects from the African continent and didn't want to obviously go with bright white mannequins. Yeah, so our decision here, um, because we had the bright white mannequins, but, um, and the other problem about, about it, because we are dealing with, um, with different races and, and South Africa in particular is really, they sort of call themselves a rainbow, um, rainbow nation in that they have people of all sorts of diverse, um, diverse cultures and races. Um, and so we wanted to get away from having um, mannequins that had Christy Turlington's face because it isn't just, it isn't just sort of a generically white mannequin, literally and figuratively. It's, it's a very specific Caucasian face. And so we wanted to get away from, from that sort of reference. And so we chose headless mannequins for it. Um, and so we purchased the contemporary, the sort of the, the army of contemporary mannequins um, in order to, to, um, to use in this, man in this exhibition. But then also we had the question of skin tone. And um, so we made the decision that rather than have them be white, we had them be a, a light gray. And that was getting away from even the sort of the metaphorical reference to, to white skin tone. Um, and so that was our decision for the fashions of Southern Africa. And so because of that, we, we had that whole, the whole collection of contemporary mannequins, we painted a light gray. Um, and then um, for the next, for one of the later exhibitions we did, we had even greater diversity of, um, of mannequins when we did our For the Birds exhibition. Um, um, and so, so Jim, could you talk a little bit about the decisions that we made in terms of mounts for that? Yeah, I, this was a multicultural exhibition, uh, as you can see. And so, <clears throat> for example, the Cheyenne headdress that we had on display, we decided to just eschew putting it on a body at all. That way we avoided having a particularly white face or white mannequin. And it also showed off the object in a, in a more spectacular way, we thought. Um, and then the, the Christie mannequins, you can see in the right photograph, uh, were you know very adaptable for Western garments. Um, but we didn't want to necessarily use those for some of the Asian things like the kimonos that you see in the, in the background. So we decided to go with a, a T mount uh, for those guys. So, um, so yeah, so you can see here the, the Christie's uh, mannequins um, are doing a very good job. But um, we had a Chinese robe in particular that we didn't want to put on a Christie. So we used one of the Toledos because the facial features on those are a little more vague, um, could be read slightly as uh, Asian or um, non-Western anyway, and it seemed to work a lot better for that particular garment. So we're always trying to find ways to not, um, I don't know, we're, we're erring on the side of caution in terms of trying to make sure our mannequins are matching the culture that the garments are from. Yeah, and it came up in, in the in the for the birds that we're you know we we have a, a human body on on Western fashion and then non-Western fashion we display in a much more abstracted way in general with the with the kimonos for instance which were on the tees and with the Chinese garment we decided to treat it more like a garment rather than sort of a textile in an abstract manner in order to put it on a body to sort of contextualize it in a way. Um, since we're treating things that are Western differently than we're treating things that are non-Western. Um, so, but of course, then you have the problematic um, 
mannequin being specifically Caucasian. So that's why um, we decided to put it on on a mannequin rather than a T. Um, but then also um, why the Toledo was chosen rather than one of the um, one of the Christie mannequins. So uh, culture counterculture is one of our more recent exhibitions, and we were exploring a variety of cultures again. And so we chose mannequins to work with the the garments. These are all from the late '60s, early '70s. Um, we also had specific personalities that we were dealing with, and um, so we wanted um, want Sarah to kind of address how we how we dealt with that to start with. So, so again, then one of the sections, the first section in the exhibition is celebrities. And so we have dresses that have specific links to, um, to known people. Um, so we have a dress that was worn by Bess Meyerson, who was um, Miss America, um, Dinah Shore, and um, Kitty Carlisle Hart. Um, so we have their garments, and we decided in those to put them on Christy mannequins. Um, and then we did hairstyles on them. Because Christy has a head, they allow to have a hairstyle. So we made hairstyles that are based on images that we found of them. Um, and so we, we used it that way. But then we also had celebrities in, that are represented that are African-American. So we had, um, we had a Jimi Hendrix jacket. Uh, Lena Horne dresses, Diane, Diane Carroll piece, and then a dress um, that was worn by Diana Ross. And so in that, we, um, we didn't have heads on our, on our mannequins. Um, and we, we, they, the ones that, that are on mannequins um, are on gray mannequins with the headless, which is the same style that we had gone for the, the, um, the Fashions of Southern Africa exhibition. And um, specifically, the Lena Horn mannequins, rather than using one of the ones from our fleet, because of the sleeves, which are so tremendous on this, um, we had to use specific um, store mannequins. Um, and so, um, so here we have one of the dresses, one of the Lena Horn dresses, and this is a picture of her wearing it to, I think it was the Grammys. Um, and then we dressed it on a headless um, gray Christie mannequin. Um, and then finally, when it's actually in the exhibition itself, we had it mounted on a store mannequin. So we have these old mannequins that are even from before the days of getting the Christie's that are in wild and exuberant poses. And because of the sleeves, we wanted arms that were bent. Um, and the existing um, contemporary mannequin has down arms that wouldn't work at all on these dresses. So we made the decision to, to paint some of and decapitate some of of our um, store mannequins. And the next, the next slide shows the other Lena Horn dress. Um, and this is, so I found, dug up some old pictures of the mannequin on a different piece. Um, and so you can see it used to be um, a, a quote unquote flesh colored um, mannequin. It was sort of this nude um, color that they used to use um, for mannequins here. And then we have since replaced that with white, and then we are now moving towards other colors other than white. Um, and particularly for something for Lena Horn, um, we wanted to go with the, the neutral gray. Um, so, and again, her um, gym moved her, um, her head. Uh, and so that's the, the pose that she now is in. Um, so as we go forward, oh, and here's, here's another um, view of culture counterculture. Um, and this shows some of the choices. And actually, to get back to the question of the head versus the non-head, um, the whole exhibition is sort of premised around this dichotomy between culture and counterculture in the 1960s. And you sort of have high fashion, and then you have sort of streetwear, and you have this sort of these, these parallel um, strains that were running through fashion at the time. And so my decision was to give the culture mannequins heads and the counterculture were the headless, um, just as a way to divide it and because we had, you know, two sets of groupings of mannequins. And so the culture mannequins were generally the ones that had the hair and um, the counterculture ones were the ones without the heads. Um, and so here you see the decisions. Um, and so we made hair out of, um, out of, Paper, of craft paper um, and and so they have these wigs and we decided um, that in, in addition to having you know sort of these these more Caucasian 
uh, style of hair. Um, we have one that has an afro, which was really an important style innovation um, from the 1960s. And, um, and so that was one of, one of the hairstyles. This one here is um, we gave um, our, our efforts at, a, at an afro. Um, and then, um, and then, Jim, I don't know if you could talk a little bit about our decisions um, in our discussions that we have going forward with what kind of mannequins we are looking to add to the collection. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, recognize that as the culture is shifting and <clears throat> with the movements of Black Lives Matter and things like that, that we, we need to do a better job of uh, adequately representing uh, various cultures, uh, BIPOC cult cultures. So we're shopping around trying to find, um, you know, mannequins that represent a more typical uh, black body, uh, mannequins that are gender fluid, mannequins that are um, more genericized, um, you know, facial features that aren't so distinctly white or European or whatever. Um, it's a bit of a challenge, as I'm sure all of you are facing at the same time. Um, and some of the other challenges include, like, how do we manage all of these parts and all these, these rainbows of color? If we start to do, um, you know, brown or metallic or darker grays, um, suddenly we have an inventory issue where you have, you know, X numbers of arms that are this color, but don't necessarily suit the exhibition you have. So a lot of repainting and stuff that we would like to avoid. Um, and then of course, just the, the basic idea, I'm really sorry about that, the basic idea that, um, you know, what is, the, what is the proper color to use? Um, you know, how do you pick a particular shade of brown, black, gray, white, um, to, to serve your purpose without being insulting or stereotypical or any of those things. So those are some of the things that I think we have to deal with. Yeah, and we and we also have, and so in addition to having the issues of sort of color and um, and and cultural racial issues, we have you know, body size and body shape um, issues. Um, all of the mannequins that we've we've shown you are all sort of fashion model um, sizes, and and they're also over six feet tall. And um, and the people in general, and the people who own these clothes, even were not over six foot tall and they were not necessarily fashion models. And so um, getting diversity in body type is really is really hard. It's one thing to just paint the mannequin, um, but to sort of represent different sizes and shapes is a, is a big challenge. Um, and so it's difficult to know how much you want that to be built into the mannequin and how much you want that to be um, added when you're dressing an individual garment. And we didn't really touch on some of our historic mannequins. We have. Uh, a small fleet that we call the Kyoto mannequins that are actually fairly adjustable for height and easily padded out. Um, so yeah, there's there's just a bunch of different uh, different things that we're looking at. You know, um, those are particularly good because they have historical silhouettes, Belle Epoque and you know, 18th century, 19th century. Um, so there's there's just lots of challenges in, involved in keeping a uh, a fleet of mannequins that is workable for the garments you want to show and um, represent cultures better. So it's it's just something we're going to keep working on. All right. Anything else you can add? I think we can wrap it up there. Okay. <laughs> so we we will be open for questions uh, at the end of the uh, presentations. So thanks. Thank you. I'm a conservator working at the Anchorage Museum here in Alaska, and I'm not a mount maker, but I have been fortunate to be involved in the mannequin making process at various places I've worked, including with Shelley at the National Museum of American Indian. This experience has greatly shaped my approach to mannequins for the safe display of clothing. I wanted to share an example from the opposite point of view, with the deinstallation of an entire gallery and the deconstruction of 30-year-old plaster mannequins based on real people. 
and the new approach we now use to support clothing realistically but safely. In 2016, the Collections Department started the challenge of deinstalling the old Alaska Gallery, at that time the largest exhibition space in the museum. As a textile conservator, I was relieved as the old dioramas and cases were not sealed, so after 30 years on display, a significant level of dust had built up on the clothing. Also, the old mannequins were very heavy, rigid, and the joints were inflexible. They were not formed to the clothing, often causing stress to the skins or textile fibers. Area around shoulders, bent knees and buttocks were subsequently deformed and misshaped. The old mannequins were not constructed from archival materials, being molded from plaster with metal connectors. There was no protective barrier between the mannequins and clothing, with pressure sensitive tape and plaster being in direct contact. Often the surface of the mannequins was crumbling and powdery, leaving abrasive particles of plaster inside and on the clothing. The Parker hoods in particular were often tightly fitted around the mannequin heads and necklines, causing stress to the skins of the fur clothing. The fur was crushed, hair broken from the Parkers being positioned under the legs of heavy weight and mannequin, and in some cases the clothing was hanging unsupported and without appropriate padding. The shape of the mannequins, often being too large and too exaggerated, stretched the fabrics in these areas and permanently deformed the clothing, especially where the mannequin backs were curved and the knees were bent. During deinstallation, there were many occasions where it was incredibly difficult to remove the clothing from the mannequin due to the articulated mannequin positions with bent legs, arms and feet we had to assess the best method to remove the torsos and heads from inside the parkas while trying to mitigate excessive handling often required in this particular circumstance. The old mannequins did not permit safe dressing and undressing of the clothing. Each item of clothing was different, so we had to evaluate each step of a removal on a case-by-case -case basis. It soon became clear that the mannequins were not constructed exactly the same. Sometimes we were unable to remove the steel connection pins in the arms, so it was necessary to carefully cut through the aluminum joints to remove hands and forearms. This all had to be undertaken under not ideal circumstances, with the mannequin still dressed with the clothing, causing unnecessary and avoidable stress to the skins and textiles and to the conservators who had to do the work. We also had to be sensitive during this whole process as the mannequins had been shaped based on real people within the Alaska community. So we did not reuse the old mannequins, but instead the new mannequins are now made from archival materials. Not one is the same shape or size. The new mannequins have been individually padded, but not over padded, which would cause damage to the clothing, which is stress on the seams and stretching the skins. Some of the mannequins feature shoulder wings, which is a clever way to add more padding to the shoulder area, but still allow easy access to connect or remove the mannequin arms. The new mannequins were modified for each item of clothing. Areas of weakness, such as the shoulders, upper arms, neckline, parker hoods, are now fully supported, reducing stress on the seams and creases in the skin. The mannequins now allow for safe dressing and undressing of the clothing. The final display gives the illusion that the clothing is being worn on the body without looking too human-like or overly bulked out. These beautiful parkas and tunic can be seen in the new Alaska exhibit, having been part of several programs throughout the museum. We understand the need for Alaskan artists and makers to easily see the construction and embellishment details in order to continue these traditions. And so this, as well as supporting the clothing, is a main focus of our approach to mannequins at the Anchorage Museum. So much to think about in those three um, presentations. Just a reminder that we'll be taking your questions at the end of the session, but keep the questions coming. Okay, we have now come to the Now You See Me portion of the day. Both of the following two talks in their own way address specific 
solutions to challenges around showing human extremities in the mannequins on display. Laura Flecker, Principal Textile Conservation Display Specialist at the Victoria and Albert Museum, London, UK, will talk about her approach to historic versus contemporary mannequins for the Fashion by Nature exhibition. Brett Angel, Senior Exhibitions Preparator for Objects at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston in Boston, Massachusetts, USA, will speak on how a mannequin is converted in a recent exhibition at the MFA. Right, uh, let's get started. Okay, so over the last few years, the V&A has staged a number of exhibitions about well-known personalities and the need to find and create suitable mannequins for real people such as David Bowie and Frida Kahlo has taken us on some very interesting journeys. Although I love banging on about these exhibitions, I thought I'd take this opportunity to look at a less high profile mannequin conundrum that I came across when working on a recent exhibition called Fashion from Nature. The issue was this, and I'm sure it's a familiar one for many, how to create animated figures for multiple historic garments on a small budget. Fashion from Nature was staged at the v in 2018. As the title suggests, the exhibition explored the complex relationship between fashion and nature through the ages. This meant that a mix of objects from different periods were to be shown, the list included around 90 outfits spanning five centuries, the oldest from the 1600s and the newest from the present day. The curator's display vision was to bring the costumes to life by mounting them on full fiberglass mannequins. Stylized heads were chosen with blown back features and molded hair. This got around the problem of covering bald heads without the need for wigs, which the curator was also keen to avoid. For the contemporary dress, this was fairly straightforward. There are many off-the-shelf mannequins to choose from with blown back features and moulded hair. And as long as you aren't doing an Alexander McQueen exhibition, they can usually be adapted to fit most modern garments. Unfortunately, the same cannot be said for historical dress. Tiny sizes and corseted shapes means that finding anything off the shelf can be tricky. Add in arms, heads and a moulded hairstyle and you're asking for a mannequin miracle. It's for this reason that we tend to use simple papier-mâché bus forms at the v &A for historical dress. These basic torsos have the advantage of being cheap and coming in small sizes. They provide a sturdy foundation which can be adapted with padding to the right size and shape to fit individual garments. The figures can then be covered in a top layer of fabric, hiding the padding from view and giving a professional display finish. As purchasing expensive custom-made figures was out of the question, it soon became clear that using bust, a bust form was our only option. The challenge was transforming these headless tailors dummies into animated figures that could hold their own against the modern mannequins in the show. The curator wanted to avoid the kind of contrast that you can see in this slide and was determined to give the historic dress the same treatment as the contemporary fashion. Fortunately, most suppliers also offer some head and arm options for bus forms. Fabric covered heads and articulated arms are commonly used in museums and they seem the obvious choice for us. Our challenge lay in how to achieve a subtly moulded hairdo. In order to conceal unsightly padding, it was essential for us to use a torso with a fabric finish. But what about the head? Covering moulded hair in, in material would be very difficult and time consuming, and it probably wouldn't look that great either. In the end, we solved the problem with papier-mâché. This is what we did. Uh, so first of all, we bought a cheap raw papier-mâché bust form lots of them, um, and had them covered in a final layer of exhibition paper, uh, and we used this as our display finish. Next, we added adolescent-sized articulated arms to each torso. These are smaller than contemporary sizes and a good fit for historic garments. We then commissioned the mannequin company to make a new head mould with stylized hair. Although the mould itself was pricey, once it had been made, the heads could be churned out very cheaply. 
These two were finished in a final layer of exhibition paper and care was taken to follow the natural contours of the hair, which added to the visual effect. It was now down to us to do the rest. The process of making underpinnings, padding up the figure and covering it in a layer of stretch jersey was carried out as normal. But once this work had been completed, there was one final step. Any jersey visible above the neckline of the costume had to be coated with papier-mâché so that the surface of the torso matched the head. To do this, we marked the neckline of the garment onto the figure and stitched a band of bias tape beneath. This acted as a binding to the papered area and helped prevent it from cockling as it dried. The paper was torn into bits and applied on top of the fabric using wheat starch paste as an adhesive. Special care was taken to blend the new layers of paper with the original neck so that there were no obvious joins and the head could be fitted without difficulty. So this solution was perhaps not the fastest method on record, but it helped bring the historical costume in the exhibition to life in a way that our standard headless torsos could not have done. The lack of mannequin choice for period dress continues to be a big problem and is something that needs tackling, but that's a project for another day. I'm Brett Angel, and I'm the Senior Exhibitions Preparator at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. For this talk, I'm going to cover the extensive mannequin modifications required for the 2019 Endebelli Exhibition. This showed both traditional and contemporary Endebelli costumes, and Catherine Gunch was our curator, and Joel Thompson was the conservator for this project that I worked with. As you can see in from the previous images, brass rings were featured prominently in the women's costumes. We decided to make actual brass rings for this exhibition. I believe I made about between 60 and 70 rings, both for the ankles and the neck itself. So I started by annealing the brass rods that were selected to use for the rings. You can see that on the left. And that, of course, is to make them pliable, to pull them around the form that you see here. While this is a very low-tech um, procedure, it worked very well and took the better part of one day to fabricate them all. I made the lengths longer than they needed to be so that it was easy to pull them around the wooden form. Here's the finished, very rough form with the extra parts uh, extending past the circumference of the ring. On the left, you see the rough, unclipped, scorched lengths, and on the right, um, the ex excess lengths were cut off. After clipping, I then put each one in a parrot vise to realign the ends so that it looks like a single ring again. Here I'm taking the grinder with a flap disc to quickly finish the top and bottom portions of the ring, removing any scorch marks and metal marks. And here we are with that step completed. And then a final polish with steel wool to give it a shiny, smooth surface overall. So on the left are the finished rings, and on the right, they, there they are in their kind of more rough state. After the polishing was finished, um, I stored them in sealed bags until they could be put onto the mannequins. This was all very last minute, which is probably not a surprise to any of us. Um, so there was not adequate time to seal them with any kind of clear coat. So we wore gloves to keep them clean and kept them in bags until the actual installation time. Because the rings are brass, the accumulation of them obviously created a significant amount of weight. We didn't want the weight of the rings pushing down on the lower beaded cuffs, which are actual objects. So I made tabs on the bottommost ring that screwed into the mannequin itself.
The mannequins are from MD Studios, and the model is Sintensi, and they're made out of acrylic. And I have to say, for the amount of cutting and drilling and refabricating and reattaching, that these were just absolutely fantastic. So I highly recommend them for anyone else that has to really Frankenstein together a mount. Catherine, our curator, consulted local and belly folks to determine what an appropriate color would be. Would we need to paint them? Would we need to cover them with some type of material? In the end, it was decided that a literally black colored mannequin would be the most appropriate and respectful. In order to be able to put the rings on the mannequin, I had to literally cut the feet off so the rings could be passed over the ankles. That's what you're seeing here, that first initial cut. Here are the countersunk holes. The bolts will eventually go through the heel of the foot and into the ankle. On the left, you can see the threaded brass inserts that will take the bolt on the right. And then here I am attaching the feet and securing the bolts. And here we see the finished look before the mannequin actually gets dressed. Please notice in this picture too the space between the beaded cuffs. The legs had to be intentionally spaced apart otherwise the cuffs would have been bunching up and rubbing on each other. So as you can see here there's actually a little bit of space between the cuffs on the bottom which are the actual um, objects. And so had we not spaced the legs, those would have been just literally bumping into each other. So in order to do that, here we are with more amputation, unfortunately. Um, you can see on the right, another bracket is set into the mannequin. Um, here I used a jigsaw to make the cut. The bracket was slotted so that the leg, once it's attached, can have adjustability and be able to move back and forth. Here are the brackets in the body and the leg bracket joined together. On the left, I'm showing you how the bracket can be adjusted by sliding it back and forth in the slots before we lock it down. And on the right is the finished leg attached. And so again, you can probably notice how it can move to the left or the right. On the left is the mannequin then before it gets dressed, and on the right, the fully dressed mannequin. So, as you can see, you'd be none the wiser of all the modifications that are going on underneath. Finally, I wanted to show you a really quick, uh, radically altered mannequin. On the left is the finished dress mannequin, and on the right is the cut-up mannequin. So, as you can see, large portions were removed to fit the petite costume. Notice how thin the breastplate area is cut, and yet it is still quite strong. Again, this is the Sintensi mannequin, save tight, made out of acrylic. I also had to cut away a portion of the torso length and then reattach it with clips. So that's what you're seeing on the inside. That's what those brass clips are. That's reattaching the upper part of the torso to the lower part. And then finally, um, this is a detail just to show you that all the finishing was done again with a grinder and a flat disc. So you can see how easy it is to radically alter these mannequins and then they still hold up. So um, I'm quite impressed, I have to say, with this particular mannequin type. Wow, two fantastic solutions. Thank you both. And it's great to see so many questions coming in. Again, we will get to those at the, after this final set of presentations. So the last four talks of this session refer to the and now you don't part of the day. In the first presentation, the mannequin must convey a very specific context or purpose with no other material than the costume itself. And in the three presentations that follow, the mount or mannequin needed to give form or reference to a human body without showing a human form beyond the objects themselves. So Sam Gatley of the object support team at the Tapapa Museum in Wellington, New Zealand will present her solution 
for a complex mount for a riding habit. Mayor Latouche of Benchmark of Rosemont, New Jersey, USA, will speak on various active and animated forms she has made. Heidi Saranga, Senior Conservator, Head of Collections Care Management Access Department at the University of British Columbia Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, will present a talk called There Are Two Sides to Everything, a Mannequin for Weavers, where she shares her solutions for an invisible support for Chilkat weaving and an internal mount for Kwakwak Kiwat headdress. And finally, Ian Hart, Natural History Exhibit Preparator from San Francisco, California, USA, will present his solutions to mounting a queue of human hair for an exhibit on discrimination, a mount making story. Hi, I'm Mary Latouche from Benchmark, and I have a small presentation of mannequins that I've made that have been in very active poses. And so that's the theme of this uh, slide presentation. Most of the mannequins that I've been asked to make have been solitary standing sort of fashion, like here I am standing upright with this piece of clothing on. But on a couple of occasions, the designer has wanted mannequins to display more action. At the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC, there was a gypsy dress that the designer wanted to see in a swirl like it had just frozen in a dance. A GI standing in a sort of John Wayne hip slung kind of a fashion, a Nazi guard in a menacing wide leg stance. The mannequins I'm showing here are from an exhibit at the Flint Center at Historic Deerfield, where the designer had imagined characteristic poses from the lives of those that had worn the clothing, men and women in elegant 18th century garb together in conversation, a fellow in the army ready to draw his sword, although there was no sword, a young skivvy peeking out at the world of her betters from behind a doorway, a young gallant at a ball, and so on. The mannequins would assume the poses, the portraits on the walls around the space would provide the faces of the time. Let me admit to being a bit cranked when, um, let me move this over here, <clears throat> to being a bit cranked when this assignment first came my way, the poses were all so very much more activated than we usually had to carve. But once I got over that, it was nothing but fun. This first mannequin is my favorite. This is the dancing gallant. My initial carving was rather upright, as you can see, as I felt my way into his pose. I have a physical memory of this mannequin that involves making huge slice across the stomach once he was shaped like seppuku. Uh, and into this gash, I glued big chunky wedges of ethafoam that resulted in the graceful backwards bend to his upper body. Likewise, a large slice at the top of his thigh in the back up here. Another wedge of ethafoam to cant him forward. And there he is in the dancing pose. The infinite workability of ethafoam is one of the things that I really, really like about it. So I say um, carve. I preferred, uh, my preferred way to make a mannequin is to find the shape and what amounts to a block of ethafoam. It's a reductive process for me. Of course, mannequin making can be additive, of course, I used to do that, but I came to feel that carving down to the shape of the real body, even when the parts of that shape would not remotely telegraph through the clothing was the best and fastest way for me to understand what needed doing. So you'll see that these mannequin shapes are very much human shapes. A frequent element in my mannequins is the use of satin to help slide clothing onto the form. You see it here, you can see it on the upper arms and the shoulder of the dancing man. And here again, on the tops of the arms. One of the biggest things to consider in all the mannequins is the dressing. And that mostly, for me, mostly means arms. I haven't dealt with any of the wonderful hardware that's now available to attach arms and to activate joints. 
So my decisions are always, how long of a solid ethavalm stub can I make beyond the shoulder and still be able to dress the form? At what point do we add to the stub what we call sausage arms, three inch stockinette stuffed with poly batting that allows you to stuff the sleeves in, stuff the arms into the sleeves of the costume, sort of like dressing a floppy three-year-old. Or in some cases, do we make removable arms, which I have some examples of coming up in a moment. Here is the guy dressed. You see he's also got a lovely pair of black britches. And there he is. Um, for the dancing men, because the coat opened up so easily, we didn't need to make removable arms. I can't quite remember, but I think we inserted an aluminum rod, perhaps 3 16 in diameter, into the ethafum stub and wrapped it around with poly batting in the sausage part. And this allowed his arms to be bent at the elbow and to stay there. This next slide is the army fellow. You see the designers drawing the concept of his reaching for his sword. In this instance, both arms were moved to dress the mannequin, as you can see in this amended photo. Um, again, the use of satin slide and note to myself up top here, which says this is very forced position for this coat's arms and I don't recommend it at all. Oh well. To return to the removable arms for a moment, here's the uh, guy dressed. There. Um, <clears throat> the removable arms we do by means of a mortise and tenon. I'll often give that a triangular shape and make it as large as I can. Um, it turns out that a cut ethafoam surface has a great ability to grip to another cut ethafoam surface when it's inserted and it's a perfect match. And we make use of that in this case. Sometimes we'll augment the mortise and tenon with twill tapes. I'll put twill here and here and make it into a triangle and have a Velcro at the top. And that'll go across the shoulder here with a Velcro tab up here. I don't think we did that in this case. It didn't need it. So the next two examples are from the elegant couples that peopled this exhibit, a seated lady and a standard gent with his arms behind his back in a conversational repose. The first slide is again, the worksheet I try to keep on every mannequin. Here you can see the drawing that we were given to work to, including my sketch of how we were going to seat her. She's very straightforward, essentially just a torso. Because her body was so very tight and very tiny. We made very little by way of solid arms below her actual shoulders. Most of what you see here is the um, sausage arms. About half of the arm is sausage. The fun of this mannequin was this great petticoat that uh, uh, held her skirt out. And also it was completely, what was very successful about this mannequin I remember was the inference of her thighs uh, under the uh, skirt when she was dressed. Hard to see here, but take my word for it. This photo also gives you an idea of the portraits that were used to fill in where our mannequins left off. And now we come to the gentleman. Um, you can see here the concept again of the uh, designer. This is the mannequin that we were to make. And here was a portrait behind that uh, gave an indication of the people here. The tricky part of this mannequin was that the arms were to be behind his back. Both of the arms had to come off um, to accomplish this. <clears throat> we had to remove them both. The dark blue line here shows where the arms came out. The lighter blue is a sort of outline of the, um, of the satin that uh, uh, helped the, you can see it on the back here as well help the uh, costume slide on. The coat was to be a very tight fit, as you can see here. Um, and so the satin was to help so I could tweak it once it was dressed. Um, the arms, because they both removed, uh, it was very uh, easy to dress the mannequin here. They were easily inserted into the sleeves of the coat. 
but nonetheless, we made very deep Vs, V cuts at the elbow in the ethophone. And this allowed us somewhat to flex the ethophone to get it into the sleeve. And then once it was dressed, the bent shape would just resume. Um, because the arms were rather meaty in this instance, it was a good choice. And again, they were covered in satin to help the slide. Lastly, since we're talking about mortise and tenon, um, I wanted to show you an example of a different use rather than for removable arms. Many Native American dresses have to be shown with the arms straight out in kindness to the heavily beaded yokes that so many of them have. Our solution to dressing these gals again makes use of the mortise and tenon. Here you see the arms half of the mannequin with the mortise on the underside. The photo is a bit hard to read, but um, this is the stub of the neck with, uh, we're looking at it from the underside. This is the stub of the neck with the uh, exhibit fabric on it. Also at the ends of the arms, the exhibit fabric. So this part of the form of the mannequin form slides into the dress from one wrist through to the other wrist. Of course, you have to pay attention here that this dimension will easily uh, insert at that point. And so we spent a little bit of time making sure that it was reduced enough to be able to go through. But once the dress is on here, it can be very easily carried over to the torso part of the form. And here you see the torso. This is the tenon hidden behind the bust. And <clears throat> excuse me, once you have the once you have the mannequin, uh, once you have the dress on the mannequin, you can just lift it up and lower it onto that tenon um, very easily. It is really, really easy. And here you see it assembled. And also here assembled, you see that the black line of course is, is my drawing on there to show you where the seam would be. Okay, so those are just a few of my ideas, a few examples of activated, uh, activated mannequins that we have made in the past. And I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks a lot. I wanted to share with you today two examples of mounting solutions that we have come up with here at the Museum of Anthropology at UBC in response to a couple different problems. One was that question we all love, which is make us a mannequin that's invisible. And the other is uh, the solution to uh, the, the question of how can we mount something so that it can be worn in ceremony. So the first is this Chilkat weaving. It was one of the pieces that was selected for an exhibit that's currently on now, entitled In a Different Light, Reflection on Northwest Coast Art. And it presents over 100 historic Indigenous artworks through the voices of contemporary First Nations artists and community members. So these are presented to the public uh, through stories and through tellings and through different ways of understanding that might normally be seen at the museum. And for this piece in particular, it was important for it to be presented for the weavers. And every weaver that I have known is always deeply interested in the back of the weaving, even more so than they are in the front of the weaving, because all of the starts and the stops reveal uh, a massive amount of information about the, the weaver or the decisions that they made about their weaving. And William White is a, a Simpson Chilkat Weaver, and he um, has taught us uh, over and over again how important this is. And he was the one speaking to this weaving in the exhibit. And with his guidance and with the curatorial guidance, we came up with the idea of um, the invisible mount that I'm going to show you now. And we were challenged because it couldn't be presented flat in a case that would be able to see both sides. They wanted it to be presented as though it would be on a form, as though it was being worn by somebody. So the first step for us is understanding what that form would take, would, would look like. And anybody who's 
worked with the weaving, it's, it's, it's quite hard to imagine it unless you actually are able to drape it over somebody to see how it hangs. So we had one of the curators involved, Bill McLennan, uh, serve that role for us to, to wear the robe so that we could uh, understand how it would fall. And then from that, we were able to carve down an epiphone form that was the same shape as him as he was holding his arms and we knew it would fit into the case in this form. The next step here was to uh, put in a little bit of structure so that the weaving could be supported. We knew we wanted to work with cloth shape because it was thin and light enough in order to make that invisibility happen that we were looking for. So my colleague and I, Carl Schlichting, worked together and he manufactured, uh, designed and manufactured this metal armature underneath. And what you're seeing here is the metal flat bar that has been painted. And it's also got perforations along the, along the length, which we'll speak to in a moment. So you can see this over top of the Tyvek that we're using as the template for the cutting of the cloth shape. And here you can see the cut and set cross shape in shape over top of the metal form. And then you can see along the edges the zap straps that we fed, threaded through the holes in the flat bar in order to secure it in place. Now, the, the challenge with the cross shape is it does a great job in, in creating that form, but it's still on its own won't support the width or the, the weight of the blanket crossways. So Carl came up with, oops, sorry, Carl came up with inserting these um, uh, we were calling them ribs, stainless steel rod ribs that were bent into shape and that I stitched through to the cross shape and they did a wonderful job of sticking that way. And then the last component of the form itself was uh, around the neck where there was just a little bit too much weight and too much pull and they weren't happy with the way it was settling on the mount. And we resolved that by putting in um, a little extra dimension using four ply black mat board. And then here you have the mount uh, after it's been covered with black cotton jersey. You can see a little bit of the cross shape poking through on the bottom. And then the, the arms or the feet that extend to the, to the kit base. And then the final results here where we have uh, a wonderful open view into the interior of the weaving where you can see all of that working. And then I should note that the whole write-up for this mount is being included in the, the updated publication on mount making from the Canadian Conservation Institute. This is a second example, which is not a, a mannequin per se, but it is definitely a mount for the people, and in fact, an actual person. This is a Thunderbird headdress that had been requested to travel to Alert Bay for use in the potlatch by the family that had originally held held this in the possession and still held the rights to use it. And I worked on this solution with um, the late Clock 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 artist and hereditary chief Bo Dick. And together we worked on not only, or he, he recreated the missing elements, I dealt with strengthening the wood so that it could be danced. But the other thing that we had to work with was the fact that the rigging, the interior rigging was missing and as such it couldn't be used. And Bo had, when we were tossing the ideas around, he had said that, well, we might, you know, we would have used a hat, stitch a hat through it, but that had some challenges. What hat? <laughs> Where was I going to find a hat? What size of hat? But then, of course, I immediately thought foster might be able to do that. And the dancer who would be using it wasn't in Vancouver. He was up in Alert Bay, which is a, a seven hour commute. So I had to work with um, measurements that I could get from people at NOAA, but everybody was very helpful. And together we came up with what is basically a hat on the inside. And that was stitched to a donut, which was um, being used to take up the excess space. Otherwise the headdress would have stopped too low. And then once we were up in Alert Bay, we were able to do the fitting. This is Daryl Dawson, who was going to be dancing the headdress. And you can see here the fast shape is not quite set. I left that final setting to be done after the fitting. And then um, following this, it was covered with black jersey. And then we were all also able to stitch in the, the other component of the rigging, which is the bands, the large bands that wrap around the waist of the dancer. And here you have, uh, this is <laughs> myself and Bo in the hotel room late at night before the, the, the morning 
activities at the potlatch where he's just getting the final pieces in place and then I'm stitching everything together on the headdress. And it actually worked out quite well. And now we really understand, acknowledge that these changes in the use are part of the headdress. So they weren't removed when it came back from travel. They're um, on display with the headdress as it is in our visible storage multi-person gallery. I want to tell you a story about mounting a queue of human hair for an exhibit on racial discrimination that was part of the 2019 exhibition Skin, Living Armor, Evolving Identity, produced and presented at the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco. The show opened in the spring and ran for about six months. The first part of the exhibition was about the comparative biology of skin, it presented a diversity of animal skin types, functions, and products, including scales, feathers, and hair. The second part of the exhibition was devoted to topics related to human skin and skin color. The biology, physiology, and evolution of dark and light skin pigmentation in humans was presented, followed by a history of racial discrimination and the cultural evolution of racial identities in the Americas and in the U.S. in particular. While curating this section of the show, our exhibit developer, Ryder Diaz, reached out to the Chinese Historical Society of America, a culturally specific history museum located in San Francisco's Chinatown, for ideas about what objects in their collection might help to tell the story of racial definition and discrimination with a local focus. Collection stewards at the CHSA suggested several objects. One of those was the queue that is the subject of this talk. A 41 inch long braid of human hair interwoven with silk cords. It's more than 100 years old. A 19th century San Francisco law known as the Q Ordinance empowered law enforcement to cut off the long braided hair worn by Chinese men at the time. Because of this history, and because hair is a product of our skin, the Q was a natural choice for the exhibit. The exhibit production team, including the developer, designer, mount maker, and registrar, visited the CHSA to assess the queue, its physical and effective condition, and discuss mounting possibilities with CHSA staff. Together, we decided to mount the queue vertically. We wanted to show the braided hair in a position that would associate it with a real person, its former wearer. We felt that showing the queue in another position stretched out horizontally, for example, or coiled up, as it was in its storage container, would not promote the same effect. With the mounting concept decided, the main challenge was then how to support and position the queue in the vertical position we chose. The plan, a removable mat to which the queue would be attached and a separate wedge built into the case back to hold it. The mat would be secured to the wedge with adhesive back hook and loop I chose matte board for the facing panel because its surface qualities were similar to the matte painted interiors of the rest of the display cases. Its low profile would also allow us to get more tilt out of the shallow case. The attachment for the cue to the facing panel? Ribbons cut from black crepeline pulled through slots cut in the matte board. Crepeline, if you aren't familiar with it, is a very fine open weave silk fabric. There are two crepeling ribbons supporting the tassel in this photo close-up. Here's the materials list. And now, on to methods. I marked key features of the queue on folder stock and cleanly transferred this pattern to the mat board with pinpricks. A neat ribbon can be made from crepeline by cutting perfectly along the grain. It was efficient to pull a series of threads from the fabric and then cut the ribbons. I found it helpful to weigh down one or both sides of the fabric as I cut. An optivisor and tweezers were other pieces 
of indispensable equipment for working with this very fine fabric. After making slits in the mat to pass the ribbons through, I widened and then burnished the slits with a scalpel and dental pick. Then, I pushed the first end of the ribbons through the mat using folder stock. After positioning the cue on the mat according to the transfer marks, I brought the free end of the crepeling ribbon over the cue, shielding it with a paper scrap to avoid catching any hairs, and then used folder stock again to push the second end of the ribbon through to the back of the mat. I knotted the crepeling ribbons on the back and taped down the free ends to prevent movement and interference with the hook and loop. The tassel cords needed a little detail in positioning work with thread. With that done, the matted cue was ready to install in the case. Here is the wedge that will receive the mat. The bottom of the mat rested on a small metal lip shown by the arrow. On the right, the adhesive backed Velcro is installed and the wedge is ready. Once the cue was installed, I resolved a few unexpected position and support issues with stainless steel insect pins inserted into the mat. Now, the case was closed. The window, acrylic, was screwed into the case sides, sandwiched by face and backing frames. I gave a final wipe down to the front of the window, working from the top to the bottom. But what is this? At the bottom of the window, the silk cords are waving in time to my cleaning motion, and so are the hairs. My bare hand on the window had the same effect as the cleaning cloth you see in this video reconstruction. It turns out that hands and nylon are pretty good at imparting a negative charge to acrylic. The charged plastic in turn induces a charge imbalance in the silken hair, causing them to move. A triboelectric series, shown in black pen here, can help predict how materials may transfer charge when brought into contact. After testing a sample of Optium acrylic, which is made to have anti-static properties, we purchased a replacement window made of it. This solved the problem. Our project manager, Andrea Mode, was very responsive and authorized the expenditure right away. In order to avoid further handling of the queue upon deinstallation, because some breakage and hair loss did occur when the queue was coiled and uncoiled, we decided to create a new container for it and return the queue to the CHSA still attached to its mount. This was also done because of the possibility that the queue might travel in a new edition of the show. I want to step back and tell another story about this process, which involves working conditions. The mount was made in the gallery during our object installation period over the course of two days, instead of the workspace where we mounted the rest of the show. That workspace wasn't clean or secure enough. We had a moth problem there, and we felt that our mitigation attempts weren't sufficient to care for the queue properly. Fortunately, the gallery did not have a prior history of moth infestation, though we took extra precautions anyway, and it did have extra security because of the rhinoceros horn that was in the show. And now to step back a bit further. Many of you probably experienced a pause in your normal day-to-day -day work this past year. The California Academy of Sciences shut down due to COVID on the evening of March 12th. While our typical hands-on work was suspended, we had the opportunity to put time and effort into professional, departmental, and institutional reflection and planning. In the course of this work, I became acquainted for the first time with the International Council of Museums Code of Ethics. Several sections deal with ethical standards for human remains. Here is my summary. Now, I know that some of my colleagues on the production team were acquainted with the ICOM standards prior to this episode, but I didn't hear about them during this project. Nevertheless, there seemed to be a consensus around our decisions. Looking back, I'm glad we paid extra attention to our work with the queue. 
However, it's easy for me to imagine any of these decisions being made differently for reasons of time and budget. Or even if we'd had a project manager with different priorities. I hope you think that the work I've described here conforms to ethical standards for the exhibition of sensitive materials. And if not, I would love to hear why. Advocacy for ethical and professional standards can begin with any of us if we are aware of what those standards are. How do you talk about standards where you work? Wow, the, we covered a lot of ground with those presentations and I see that the Q&A has um, been quite busy. So without further ado, I'll turn things over to Laura McClure. Laura? Hey, y'all. Um, yeah, that was amazing. And there are, of course, a ton of questions. Um, the first question that we're gonna ask is to Emila and Sarah, can you please talk about the curatorial perspective and how you visualize your exhibits and the mannequins within? Do you see the poses as you choose the garments or does that reveal itself later during the process of all the other things going on? I, do you mean me, Sarah? Um, it, I, could, I'm sorry about the, the question. How do we make the curatorial decisions going along? Yeah, how do you, um, do you, when you're planning an exhibit, um, do you see the poses as you're choosing those garments? Or does that sort of reveal itself within the process? Um, yeah, I think it definitely reveals itself as part of the process. Um, and I thought it was interesting to see people who had sort of designed their their vision for the pose and then created the pose. Um, since um, and a lot of what we work with are um, we have pretty standard. We have the mannequins that have the pose that they come with. Um, since we're using you know the pre-made mannequins rather than creating them, so I sort of have to work with what I have. Um, and then the like the Lena Horn dress that had the really dramatic arms. Um, that was really a function of the sleeves that needed to be shown off. And you just needed, there's certain logistics that I was looking for, like the arms just needed to be raised um, in order to see them. And the pose just happened to be the pose that we had for the mannequin um, and it worked really well. Um, but um, we don't really, you know, using the sort of the, the fleet of mannequins that we have, we don't have as many options if we're going to go that route, um, since we tend not to um, make custom mannequins as much um, for shows, we do a lot of using the, um, the, pre, the you know, pre-designed mannequin. So I, I don't have as much of a, like a vision going into it that's realized. It's more, you know, a pragmatic um, decision. And, right. And in other exhibitions, we do actually go <clears throat> the extra mile. So, for example, we did, um, we have Catherine Hepburn's collection of costumes <clears throat> in our collection, and we did an exhibition of her stuff. And she was known for wearing pants, which was not typical for women. So, we developed articulated mannequins that I've presented at previous conferences where we could pose the pants in various. Uh, poses to match photographs and things like that. So it's a little bit of a mix of, you know, what we do. But we're a really, really small staff, so it's pretty limited. <laughs> right. Um, we have a question from Gwen Spicer. Um, and she says, I'm pleased that you both mentioned body type. At the National Museum of African American History Culture, this was a real issue and the Dorfman forms were selected and very much undersized and ill-fitted. How can we as a group get companies to assist us in these needs? Yeah, 
I wish we were a bigger market because I think that's, you know, part of the problem. It's such a niche, but um, it really is a problem. And, um, and the mannequins, the thing is that, you know, we pad out the mannequins to make them fit the, the size, but you're limited with what you can do in terms of arms and shoulders. And it's, it um, needs to fit um, a bigger, a bigger shape um, or, you know, a different shape, not, and, and not a six foot tall shape, you know, that's, that's one of the weird, you know, things about it is that they're, they're like too tall and there's not so much you can do with about that. Um, so yeah, that is a real, is a real concern. And we are trying to source some things out that way. Sarah and our director, Sarah, um, have located a company that is doing uh, specifically black mannequins. Um, so different body types, different shapes. Um, and was it Pucci, Sarah, that was doing the gender neutral, gender fluid? Oh, man Manex. Manex, yeah. <clears throat> so we are trying to find them, but like Sarah said, it's we're a pretty small market compared to retail. And you would hope that retail, though, would be starting to respond to the cultural shifts too, which might make it a little bit easier. Well, fingers crossed. Yeah. Yeah, and Pucci does have sizes mannequins that come in in different sizes, um, and those go like two, four, eight, twelve, maybe sixteen, I think. Um, so that is a promising direction too. Um, and yeah, I would certainly think that store mannequins would would head that direction, but you know, it you know, slow. And uh, we also have a question from Vincent. And he says, I want to thank you for your bravery and candidness in presenting your difficulties with mannequins and cultural representation. I would like to point out that um, though that it seems like you chose the dominant culture to have heads and you avoided heads for ethnic and counterculture mannequins. Can you explain this choice again in this light? Being headless does send a somewhat disparaging message when compared. Why not all headless? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And um, um, I will say that, um, well, first of all, the reason why they're not all headless is that we have the Christie mannequin. We don't have enough of the, of the headless mannequins to do the whole show with headless mannequins. And the Christie mannequins have the heads, and um, so, so there had to be some division made of like which ones were getting heads and which ones weren't getting heads, um, because and I sort of like not having heads for anything, um, and it saves us from doing hair. But um, but the higher ups don't like the idea of decapitating all of our mannequins because it's a um, one-way street and we can't get the heads back on them once we go <laughs> once we go that route so um so i've been overruled so far on on decapitating the fleet but um you know and, and that's and i think that's a really interesting point and i have to say that i didn't actually think of it as as so much a, a gesture against the ones that don't have heads um Although, you know, point taken, I, I hear you. And, um, and, and also, I will say that ultimately, the distinction between culture and counterculture became very diffuse. And it's not an explicit, it's not explicit in the exhibition. I don't think anyone going through it would pick up like which ones don't have heads and which ones do have heads. Um, because as I was going through and sort of curatorially, the division between what is culture counter, what is culture and what is counterculture became very nebulous. And it was very hard to keep track of what I was even saying was culture and counterculture. And, um, and while certainly, you know, the culture represented the establishment and the power structure um, and the counterculture would be people of minorities, I think in a lot of ways, the, the dresses that were um, associated with the culture um, could very easily have been worn by minorities, um, right. could have been worn by, um, you know, um, African Americans certainly dressed in you know, the same the same styles and, and the hair was also, um, you know, I looked at pictures of, of African-American women and their hairstyles as well as white women and the hair, it was not, it's not, um, it's not distinct or clear. I mean, obviously it's Christy Turlington's face. And so it's saying they're white, um, but that's not necessarily inherent in which pieces 
which pieces were um, had the heads, which pieces didn't have the heads. Um, but no, and it, it, that is really important to think about, you know, who who's getting heads and who's and who's not getting heads if we're making those decisions. Um, and and I think it is interesting to hear that 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 is you know interpreted as a value judgment against the headless. Um, because for me, a lot of the decision given in in not having heads is um, is logistical. Like, um, does the head need hair? Is the mannequin that's going to fit? Is that a mannequin that happens to have a head? So there's just a lot of decisions that are made that are not um, judgment, but but it is really you know important to keep in mind the potential. Right. Um, our next question is to the wonderful presenters. Will you discuss the pros and cons of using modified off the shelf forms versus custom made? Time. Mostly time for us because we have so many that are already in stock. Um, you know, I'm working right now on making 10 mounts for some vests and it's gonna take me the better part of this week. <clears throat> so I don't always have that luxury. Um, yeah, and I do the mounts as well. And I'm the curator, I handle the social media, you know, I, you know, sometimes I teach classes. So it, we, we just have, it's a, <laughs> we're like a short staff and there's, there's logistical issues that tend to govern things. Okay. Um, for Sarah and Jim, how do you inventory and keep track of the variety of mannequins and what features they have or what colors are um, they are at a given time? Is it a lot of visual sorting or do you maintain a detailed inventory? That is something that we just tackled this past summer, I'm happy to say. Um, we found a, um, a cloud-based relational database called Airtable that's free, which is great. And um, my students went through and inventoried and tagged with barcodes every single mannequin, noted their location, took a photograph, um, inventoried how many arms we have. Um, so we have, actually have a really good system now for keeping track of it. If, if only I would actually, you know, get out my phone and note when I move mannequins. So, you know, we'll get there. Um, but one of the things with our conversations about um, introducing color is going to be how do we track, you know, there are six Christie mannequins that are painted a darker tone and, you know, which arms go with it because not all the arms are identical. Um, so there will be some log logistical challenges, but but yeah, the barcoding has helped immensely because we can literally just pull out your smartphone, shoot the barcode, it'll tell you, you know, what shows that mannequin's been in, what condition it's in, all that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, we have a question for Laura Flecker, which is, can you share your brand um, and source of exhibition paper? Um, well, to be honest, I I would have to look that up. In in the case of the Fashion from um, Nature exhibition, we used a recycled paper that was actually used within the design of the exhibition, and that was how it was selected. Um, um, so I can't actually remember at this moment where we got it from, but I could certainly look that up. But it wasn't, a, you know, it wasn't a specific exhibition paper. It was a paper that was chosen by designers to be used um, within the exhibition. And it was a recycled paper, um, obviously um, had been chosen for this exhibition because it was all, all about nature and fashion and recycling and all the rest of it. So um, sorry not to be able to answer that a little bit more clearly. <laughs> It's nice that it was recycled. It's nice that it was. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next question is for Mayor. Um, what archival slash tested satin would you recommend for using on your on your forms? Ah, uh, well, I don't have that much access to fabric, and so I have to confess, it was Joanne's finest satin or china silk, um, white washed, ironed, 
um, and and that was that was the whole of it. Joanne's is awesome. <laughs> um, we've yeah, got a. I hardly even have a Joanne near me anymore. There. Oh no. Yeah, fabric stores are disappearing. We all have to go out and buy fabric. <laughs> Um, our next question is for Sam. Sam, what is a foam coat? Um, a foam coat was is a product that was um, first introduced to me by, actually by Shelley uh, a couple of years back, and um, I've only recently had an opportunity to use it. And um, it's basically it's a, a non toxic water based. Uh, coating that um, comes in powder form and you mix up with water and you can apply it to all different kinds of foams whether that's polystyrene or um, it's used a lot in the prop kind of world as well I think as well but perhaps Shelly or and I know the VNA have used it a lot as well so perhaps um, you could talk a bit more about that. Yeah I first learned about foam coat from Fred Sager and the folks at the Met um, because they used it a number of years ago on a mount for an Etruscan chariot where they used ethafoam and then coated it with the foam coat to paint on it and make it look like wood. So I think it's a it's kind of a gesso-like material um, that's used in theatrical, you know, movie sets and stuff like that. But they they're the ones who discovered it in my, you know, in my head. <laughs> and actually, can I just say something? Um the 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 joy of it is, is that you can sand it and make it look like fiberglass. And, and, and so certainly at the VNA, we've used it um, to kind of, you know, where we've had to cut off the back of a heel in order to get a pair of trousers on. And then you can kind of build a smaller heel and sand it back and paint it and make it look like the, the mannequin. So it's, it's, it's really versatile, it's great stuff. Yeah, we've used it for, for that kind of thing too, not necessarily there was an exhibit actually that I worked on with Emil also that we had a fiberglass horse in the exhibit that was pulling a travois mm -hmm. and then it would also have a dog pulling a smaller travois and we couldn't find a fiberglass dog but all we could find was a cloth covered dog so I had to coat it with foam coat and then make it look fiberglassy. <laughs> do, you, do you have a supplier for that? Um, I think through theatrical companies you know I just Googled foam code. I think like Dazian or, you know, those kind of places. Um, yeah. um, Shelly, we actually have another question for you. So don't go any, anywhere yet. Uh, what material is the gray mount um, of the circle of life and what is the gray finish made with? So that is foss shape. The, um, uh, the, the, all the hands and the faces and the feet, anything that was exposed in that exhibit, in the Circle of Dance exhibit, um, were covered with claw shape, essentially. And the way that I got those sculptural, you know, I, the way I created the molds were uh, in a variety of ways. So for the heads, we had, uh, I had some, you know, extra foam around, and then I used this material called Sculpt-A-Mold. It's just like a cellulose, like you use in kindergarten, you know, to make you put water in it and you stick it on things. Um, and that's not, that doesn't stay in the case. This, that I just kind of used to build up on top of the foam to create cheekbones and brow lines and noses and things, and then let that all dry. And then I use that to wrap the foss shape around. And um, so what's, what's going on, and then the foss shape, after that's steamed, then that holds its, its shape. And then we painted it with a uh, uh, gray latex, uh, low VOC latex paint that had been approved, um, uh, which really changed the texture of the foss shape and made it, it, it starts out a little bit rough, but it made it very rough. So anywhere that there's an overlap with the garment, there's a good layer of padding between the two, uh, felt or, or whatever. Um, so that's how the heads were done. And then the hands we had, there were, we kind of whittled down the number of poses with hands that we needed. So there were quite a few uh, men holding things in their right hand. <laughs> so, so we got a bunch of people together and did like a, a hand, uh, you know, a bunch of little just hand molds where we kind of had a, a party where um, I invited a bunch of people in the conservation and collections departments and um, all, the, all the men that I could get in for the male poses. 
and just had people do those poses. And uh, then we use those casts and wrap the FOSS shape around it. Um, and then, you know, uh, you, then you take off the FOSS shape and you essentially have a skin that you can use to, you can cut around and wrap around uh, any of the real support that's going on underneath. So there are mounts holding up the headdresses and, and things like that that are separate. And then the, the skins kind of wrap around. That is so cool. Um, and while I have you here, um, and maybe Emil can chime in too, um, Karen has said, I see all these beaded dance ensembles at relatively are, are relatively contemporary worn by modern people. Do you have and work with any older collections made in the past and uh, have those survived? Um, Emil, do you want? <laughs> I know. I, I was just thinking of identity by design. We still used older materials. I mean, older dresses for, mm -hmm. for that. It wasn't just a contemporary, it was just, I think the oldest one we had was the sidefold dress that had, um, was like early 18, 1800s in which we had to build a mount for that. That was just virtually, the dress had to be laid flat and that's how it was stored later. Um, but I, I don't know, do you want to add something? Well, I think that you really hit on something there because I think that depending on the fragility of the garment, no matter what age it is, um, that does restrict what we can do with it. <laughs> and so um, for the, the, all the garments that were in the Circle of Dance exhibit, for example, because those were so animated or with the, um, the dresses in the, um, the, dan the contemporary dance section of Identity by Design, we knew that there was more, you know, of course, we consulted with our conservation department to see what the dresses could actually do. And so for many of the dresses, the older dresses, we definitely could not, you know, kind of wrap them around and do all kinds of things that we might be more restricted in what the beads can take or, you know, um, any of the limitations there. Well, I remember one of the, uh, if you remember one of the little girls dresses, a little small one that's fully beaded at the top, the skirt, everything. Um, and that one, uh, we used it in this exhibition, and um, I think it was selected for, we thought about sending it for another exhibition, but we found after it was in storage that a lot of the beads were falling off it. So we, we restricted the traveling of that dress because it's so fragile and the beads were falling off, but it's a beautiful dress. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we do mount, we definitely mount older garments, but just maybe mm. not in the exact same way. Um, and we have a question that is, where did it go? Um, with all, this is from social media. Um, with all the different, more animated poses, um, how does that impact the costume? Can it create folds or creases? Um, can it create stress on the fabric? Is this still Shelly and I, or? I think this is open to anyone. Oh, okay. All right. You're here, so you should answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think for us, I mean, I, I think the ones I really did, and then Shelly probably hit this earlier, was that the more contemporary ones are, have the ones that have the more shape and the more movement to it. Um, and things that newly required, uh, I think the historic ones, we really were careful about, about those and how they were displayed and mounted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm sure that's something that everybody who, who makes mannequins um, has to think about, you know, it is, well, for light, light reasons and for, you know, uh, obviously creasing the fabric and that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, it's definitely something that you think about for sure and that you consult with your conservators and figure out what, what can be done, what should be done. Right. Um, for Laura, can you please go through the way the head was blended to the paper mache torso? What materials did you use? How long did it take to dry? And how long did it take you to adapt one mannequin? Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> So the, the blending was interesting. So what you have to remember is that we bought papier-mâché torsos already and a head 
which were covered in this exhibition paper. So we had the head and we had the torso. The padding was then sort of all over the, the body. And that what the task we had to do was, because we covered the, the, the padding in fabric, it was blending the neck in over the top of the, the fabric so that you couldn't see any join. And, and we did that by, um, I finished the, the fabric um, with a very tight band of bias banding to binding to make it as flat to the neck as possible, and then covered the layers of paper over the top. I hope that kind of makes sense. The, the, the paper, I would, I mean, papier mache, basically, it's, it's not a fast drying thing, and I tended to do it last thing in the day and would leave it to dry overnight before putting a second layer on. Um, and I was putting sort of two, sometimes three layers over the top to make a good sound solid finish to the whole thing. Um, and how long did it take me to, to adapt um, and pad up presumably one, one mannequin? I mean, it does depend <laughs> terribly on, on you, know, you know, the extremeness of the shape and the, the size of the figure that you start off with. It could take anything, um, you know, the, the, the re-sculpting of the body itself could take anything from, I don't know, a day to three or four days even. Um, but then when you add on underpinnings, particularly something as extreme as that sort of very large pannier frame that I had to make, that's obviously a, um, additional time on top. Um, and also if you're making replicas and things, that's also extra time. So it's, it, it's not a, you know, historical costume doesn't tend to be a speedy um, process, a speedy costume to mount, but, um, and then when you add in the layers of paper that you had to add in as well, um, it, it wasn't fast. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. I think it does. <laughs> um, Brett Angel, how often are you asked to recreate ornaments and, and design components for costumes or other? Um, that was really the first time. I mean, often the, the MFA Boston has a huge um, costume collection and accessory collection. And so often I'm just making uh, mounts to help stabilize or have some way for the accessories to attach. But this is probably the first time that I actually made finished pieces that were going to be visible as uh, accessories. So it was, a, it was a new first for me. And then um, really quickly, do you know who the maker is of those acrylic mannequins? The brand is MD Studios. And if you're in the US or on the East Coast, we get them from, uh, from New York City from a place called DK Display Corp. They have a website, so you can get them locally if you're in the US. Okay. I'm, I'm popping, it's Lauren, I'm popping back in as moderator and I hate to interrupt when there are so many good questions. Um, but this is all the time we have. Um, but I encourage you to take your questions and join us at the after party so we can keep the talk going. If you're not registered, you can register at the mountmakersforum.net. Um, and don't freak out, you'll be put in a waiting room. Um, just stay put. Someone will let you into the party once the host has started things. So thank you everyone for fantastic presentations and lively discussions. And thanks to all the back of house. Take care, have a good evening. See you soon.